Let's start. Let's start. Okay, I put you in mute uh, temporarily. Uh, uh, we also have some people watching us um, on, on YouTube. There are five simultaneous connections at the moment. Gabriela Turetki, who was uh, the last time she was in Luxembourg, I don't know where she is now. Uh, she she says that she cannot join Hangouts, but she will watch uh, on YouTube. Uh, thank you, Gabriela, for your presence. Petrovic Stefan also also uh, joined by by YouTube. She wrote something in Ukrainian that I do not understand very well, but I think she sent you greetings from from the southern part of Bukovina. Also, Vadim Tokar, who is uh, in Suchava at the moment, also says hello. Thank you, everyone, for your presence. Today, um, I welcome you again to uh, um, a new uh, lecture within our Jamone Open Online course of European integration. Today's lecture will address one of the most important topics and one of the most challenging topics for the European Union and for European integration at the moment. And uh, this topic is uh, home affairs, immigration, asylum, and Schengen. Um, you probably know from the news that one of the most pressing issues for the European Union in the past uh, two or three years has been uh, migration. Migration from third countries such as Syria, Afghanistan, and other, other countries. Uh, we have a very large migration inflows in the European Union. The crisis started in the year 2015, but every year the crisis repeats itself. And it's usually in these months, in these months of um, spring and summer, when uh, the 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 many more migrants arriving in in Europe, and many of them they they arrive through Turkey, through Greece, and and they really create uh, humanitarian problems. They create humanitarian problems for them, and they create also social problems and political problems for the European Union. So in this course, which is about European integration, all throughout the, the course, we have discussed current and pressing issues for the European Union. If you remember, we have discussed in, in one of our lectures how European Union's monetary policy works. We have discussed about the euro and about monetary policy in the euro area, in the eurozone. And uh, today we discuss about immigration in the EU and about Schengen. And both of these issues, monetary policy and the migration issue, are very similar issues because they, they are both two European Union policies. Some of the most remarkable achievements in European integration, such as the Euro or Schengen, these are considered by many the most remarkable achievements in, in the, in the, in, for the European Union lately. They say the euro, the possibility that we have a single currency, the possibility that people in Finland and people in Portugal and people in Greece, they have in their pockets the same currency. 
and the opportunities this creates for trade, for investment, it, it's, uh, it's one of the most remarkable achievements for the EU. Also, Schengen, the possibility to have an area without any internal borders at all, an area in Europe where there are no borders between the members of the Schengen area, not borders at all, where the borders will only remain on the maps. The borders will be a line on a map, but for people, there will be no borders at all. The possibility to travel all across Europe without any kind of border controls. This is also one of the most remarkable achievements of the European Union. But both cases, both the Euro and Schengen have something in common. And what they have in common is that they have been controversial achievements from the start. They have been controversial projects. They have been projects that when they have been created, they have not managed to achieve unanimous consent, unanimous agreement between member states. They have been very ambitious, both of them, very ambitious projects. They have been projects that started more or less in the same period. For instance, the, the, um, the euro was, uh, the, this project was approved uh, within the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992. So it was in the in the 90s, and also the Schengen Agreement. It was signed in 1985, but it didn't come into force until 1995, also in the 90s. So both of them are very ambitious, very remarkable achievements for the EU, for many commentators but they have also been from the start controversial and they have not uh, managed to, to, to gather unanimous agreement of the member states. And in this case, in the case of the Euro and in the case of Schengen, what has happened is that even though there was not unanimous agreement, the European Union or some of the members of the European Union decided to um, go further independently while leaving some more Eurosceptic member states behind. So this has been an example from the start also of a multi-speed Europe, a Europe with several speeds, with sev several groups or, or se a group of countries that goes further with integration and leaves other countries behind. This has happened with the Euro when the Euro started there were only 11 member states in the euro. More member states have joined, but some member states have not joined and probably will never join. So this is an, a clear example of a multiple speed Europe, but also with Schengen. With Schengen, that is the, the topic of our discussion today. At the moment, there are 26 countries in Schengen, which is a lot of countries. It's almost all the European Union member states, plus Iceland, Norway, 
Liechtenstein and Switzerland. Yes, so plus four countries from outside. So if there are 26 in total, it means that from the European Union, there, there are 22 and four from outside the European Union. But in the European Union, there are 28 member states. What happens with the other member states that are not members of Schengen? Yes? What are those member states? And what are the reasons why they are not members of Schengen? Well, two of them, the two of them is the case of um, the UK and Ireland. They are not members of Schengen from the start, and they have an opt out from Schengen. They have no obligation to become members of Schengen. From the start, they were skeptical. The UK mostly was skeptical with Schengen. They didn't want Schengen. Yes? And Ireland went along with the UK. Ireland was more uh, favorable to, to Schengen, but the UK and Ireland, they both have a passport union. They have a free travel area between Ireland and the UK, which is very important in the case of Northern Ireland. And if they joined Schengen, they had to join together. If the UK did not want to join Schengen, then Ireland could not join Schengen either without losing their union. Their, their uh, um, free free travel area that they had between Ireland and the UK. So these two countries did not want to join. And then there are other countries that are not members, that are members of the EU, but not members of Schengen either. And these countries are Croatia. Cyprus, Romania, and Bulgaria. In the case of Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, they are countries that joined the, the European Union at a later stage, and they would like to join probably the, the Schengen area eventually, I know they, they want, in the case of Romania and Bulgaria, they, they, they want very much to join the Schengen area. But what is happening is that some other members of the Schengen area are blocking their entrance in the Schengen area. Members such as the Netherlands or other, other member states from, from Northern Europe they are blocking the entrance of Romania and Bulgaria in the Schengen area. Yes, because they have concerns whether they are ready to uh, comply with their obligations if they become members of the Schengen area. Because you know what? If you become a member of the Schengen area, there will be no internal borders with the other members of the Schengen area which is a very good thing. But it's also an increased responsibility because it means that in the case of countries such as Bulgaria or a country such as Romania, it means that their borders will become external borders of the European Union. And they will become external borders of the Schengen area, which is a passport union. If someone is allowed to enter Romania and Romania is in Schengen, this person will be able to travel freely to Sweden, yes? Or to any other member of the Schengen area. So the responsibility is a very important one. And at the moment, these two countries, Romania and Bulgaria, they want to join, but there are other countries that say they are not 
ready for joining yes the in the case of um, cyprus it's a different case it's not a case that only that they are not uh, ready in the case of cyprus what happens is that uh, they have an internal pro problem in this country as you know the country is divided into parts it's the northern part of cyprus it's turkish controlled and the southern part of cyprus which is the more pro european part but it's the same problem that if they joined schengen it means they would have to enforce the border between the southern and the northern part of cyprus much more strongly and this would create problems the same problems that it could create in in northern ireland if ireland joined schengen so so both the euro and the schengen area have been controversial from the start they are very ambitious and very remarkable achievements of the european union but at the same time they have been controversial from the start and it was in the 90s in the 1990s when these two projects were approved when the euro was created when the idea of a european union citizenship was created when when the schengen area came into force it was in this period when we also saw in europe what is called as the end of the permissive consensus what we saw in europe is that in general opinion polls up to that moment were always very favorable to the european union and to european integration people wanted more europe people thought that everything that the european union did was a good thing it were in general very very pro european but it was in the 90s also when we had all these very ambitious projects that started in the 90s we also saw that the start of euroscepticism in europe the start of movements of people that were some of them dubious skeptical about europe some of them directly opposing europe and we saw the growth of eurosceptic parties in european parliament elections sometimes in national elections too as you know now the case of france in the case of the uk in the case of the netherlands in the case of austria poland many countries and we have seen also that that this um, how, how to say the, uh, this e, e, um, public opinion in general when not just the political parties at elections but public opinion in general in the eurobarometer surveys that measure the state of public opinion in europe they started to notice that there was a change in the 90s they started to notice a growth in eurosceptic uh, ideas in europe so as a sort of summary the schengen area is a remarkable achievement it's a very very ambitious project for europe yes but this project has also been a controversial project from the start and it is controversial again now and as in the case of the euro another thing in common is that not only they were created without all the member states they were controversial from the start they are very ambitious and very remarkable achievements but in the current 
period, both of them have been subject to um, very stringent test. They have been subject to a test that has been a very hard test. The test for the euro has been the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis and its effects on European economies has been a very, very strong test for the euro because it was a test of how the eurozone could manage, could face such a great global financial crisis that affected different countries differently how they could deal with that inside an economic and monetary union so this has been a great test in the case of schengen the test has been the refugee crisis the test has been the war in syria and the refugee crisis that it has created with hundreds of thousands of refugees arriving at the European Union asking for asylum, asylum seekers. So this has also been a test for the Schengen area because it has been a test for the countries that are external borders within the Schengen area, such as, for instance, Hungary, it has been a great test for Hungary, but it has also been a test for the internal union of the Schengen area. It has been a test for the unity of the countries that together make the Schengen area, countries that are not only Hungary, but also Germany. Yes, or Sweden, or Austria, or the Netherlands. It has been a test also when some countries have said, let's have a common policy of um, receiving these refugees, of sharing the refugees between different member states. Let's send some refugees to Romania, some refugees to Greece, some refugees to Italy and to Hungary, and to different members of the Schengen area. And agreement has been also very difficult in this respect. So it has been a test, a stringent test for the, for, for the Schengen area too. Um, this is an introduction. And now we will discuss about the 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 migration problem in europe the 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 schengen area crisis in concrete but first i would like to discuss a little bit with you to let you intervene there are now eight people watching on youtube simultaneously and uh, we have a group of students from chernivtsi in ukraine irina Please remove the the mute. Okay, Irina. First of all, you know, yeah. every week we have this lecture. Every week, I'm looking forward to Thursday so that I can have the lecture with you. And after the lecture, I put on the website the names of the people that have been present in the lecture, yes? But what happens to me is that many times I see you over there in Chernivtsi, but I do not know your names. I know you, Irina, yes? But I do not know the names of the other people. And if possible, I would like them to, to present themselves just to say their names. Okay. So that it's easier for me to remember. So here seems to be a good one. Yeah. As you know, sure. her, her. Yes. Uh, but he, she, 
she, she, she, her name is Sofia, right? Yes, Sofia Kucherivska in German as a form, and in Facebook it's uh, Stephanie Gulko. Stephanie Gulko, yes? Yeah. Indeed. I think <laughs> I, 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 I should do the same. You have different names. One yes. for Facebook and yes. one for the website. I think that's a very a very good idea. And <laughs> the, the current technologies allow that. You know? Yeah. What what um, I would need now, I would need a Ukrainian passport. In Ukraine passport, she is Sofia Kuchirika. But I need one for me. I, I need a Ukrainian passport for me. For you? <laughs> it's I illegal. Think so. <laughs> I think I may need to be a refugee in Ukraine soon, so I would need a Ukrainian passport. I would like to have one, because there's so much crisis now in Europe that I'm seriously thinking that maybe I should move to, to Ukraine. <laughs> Our legislation allows you to have just one passport, so... Just <laughs> one. It's all, the, in the Spanish system, it's the same. You can only have one, you know? But the, what, what happens is that some people have two or three or four. They just don't tell. <laughs> the government in the favor people when i saw this film this uh, the birth the born identity it's about this uh, it's like a spy or something and, I mean, and he had so many passports and so many different names like uh, sofia kucherica and stephanie gulko <laughs> it, uh, but he had so many and he had a problem of memory and he did not remember what was his real name and he looked at the passports and he saw so many and he, he could not know okay so i know one of them how about the other people there what are their names uh, next to sophia is my colleague uh, olga antokova olga olga antokova yes olga? And Antokova. Olga Antokova. Yes. How is it? Is it Olga or Olha? Olha in Ukrainian and Olga. in English Olga. Okay. And the colleague in the back? And behind of us, it is uh, one of our best students. It's Oleg. Kovalchuk. Oleg Kovalchuk. Oleg, Oleg Kovinchuk. Okay, it's good for me to remember. Now I will put your names on the website that you have attended this lecture. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I put you back in in, in mute. Mm -hmm. Lorena, your turn. Remove your mute, please. No, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the music. <laughs> I couldn't find any connection here. <laughs> a, very, a very international course. Yes, yes. I have students connecting from different places. Lorena had difficulties to connect today, and because she likes this course so much, because this is such an important course for her, she made the effort to attend the course from the place where she could find the internet connection. Thank you yeah. very much, Lorena, for your presence. It's very important for us, too. You're welcome. Good. I put you back in mute. How about Viktor Stoika? Viktor Stoika is very shy. He has connected through Hangouts, but without video. Viktor, are you there? He says, yes, I am. He writes. He doesn't speak. I think he's shy. How about Andrea? Andrea, say something. Remove your mute and say something. No. There's one Andrea there. 
but we don't know her full name. We do not know her share name. Um, okay, let's um, let's go ahead and continue with our with our lecture. Uh, we also have uh, Andrea Maxim on YouTube. Maybe it's the same Andrea. And we have Gabriela Turekin, Vadim Tokar, and Stefan Petrovic. Thank you, thank you all for your presence. <clears throat> Let's discuss about the refugee crisis. Is, as you know, there is a war in Syria. There is a civil war in Syria. It's a civil war, it's an internal war, but it's also like a surrogate war. It's a war between the United States and Russia uh, in inside the Syrian territory, yes? But uh, it's not an overt war between them. And the, the, the result of this war is that many people are fleeing the country. There are many displaced people, hundreds of 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 thousands of people in the case of the of the eu in greece in in just one day you have ten thousand new refugees arriving in greece sometimes they arrive in a, in a small greek island that has a population of three thousand people and and they see that in just one day ten thousand people arrive there yes so 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 it's it's very it's a very serious it's a very serious problem yes and uh, in, in how the european union has dealt with this crisis uh, can help us understand the european union a little bit better in this crisis also to understand the refugee crisis better uh, in my opinion the 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 european union made some mistakes uh, how they dealt with this refugee crisis but some of those mistakes were not really mistakes they were inevitable they were due to the internal differences that exist at the moment inside the European Union. As you see, the, in the European Union, there are countries, there are very rich countries, some of the richest countries in the world, and there are other countries that are poor countries within the, the low, low income, medium income countries in the world, which is low income per capita countries. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to 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 come to an agreement on on certain issues. In the case of the refugee crisis, we know the origin of the crisis. The origin of the crisis is the war in Syria, and uh, the war in Syria is an issue of foreign policy for the U.S. It's an issue of foreign policy for Russia, but it's an issue of foreign policy for the EU as well, but the EU does not have really a very powerful foreign policy to be able to react to such kinds of crisis. As you know, we will see in, in another lecture, the European Union has a foreign policy but the European Union's foreign policy is not very strong when it comes to military actions, for instance. It is not enough unity in, in the European Union to be able to have um, a common foreign policy with military implications. So the, the, the question in Syria, the origin is this, this uh, war in Syria, but the result is these refugees that come to Europe. And these refugees, they subject the uh, Schengen area to a stress. 
And the first sign of this stress, very clear sign of this stress, it came in Hungary. In Hungary, which was the, the, the first um, uh, external uh, border of this large Schengen area. Yes, because uh, Greece is disconnected from the rest of the Schengen area. But uh, Hungary is connected with all the rest of the countries in the in the Schengen area. Yes, and the problem with refugees when the first uh, high refugee flows they came into Hungary, there was the first sign of internal division inside the European Union, and it was the criticism by German authorities about the treatment that refugees were having when they were crossing Hungary. For instance, there were some, some commentators in Germany that said that Hungary was not respecting human rights for refugees, that Hungary was treating refugees unfairly. We also have to understand another problem, which is the problem that uh, the Schengen area, they, they have an agreement regarding refugees. It's called the Dublin Convention. And the Dublin Convention says that it is not possible for refugees to do as, uh, asylum shopping to choose which country uh, they want to have asylum in. And that in general, the first country where they step in, in the European Union, should be the country responsible for dealing with their asylum application. So if they first step in the European Union, in Greece, it should be Greece who is responsible for their asylum application. If they first step in Hungary, it should be Hungary. What this means is that this, if it's Italy, it should be Italy, or if it's Spain, it should be Spain. But what this means is that the, the, um, some countries, those who are on the external borders, usually are the countries where the refugees first step into the European Union, and those countries are subject to, um, to a special stress because they, they are given the full responsibility for those migrants, and also some other countries in Europe in addition for them to have such great responsibility, they have criticized them that they didn't do their job properly. So in the case of Germany, this was very visible. When the refugees came through Hungary and they were treated uh, uh, in Hungary um, in a way that in Germany it was not thought to be humanitarian, this, this, uh, this sparked some uh, critical remarks from the German government, also from the German press, from German public opinion. And they said that the refugees they were not treated properly in Hungary. And what was the result? The result was that the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, was forced by public opinion, by German public opinion, to do something about these refugees, to improve the conditions of those refugees. And what she did, she said that any Syrian refugee that arrives in Germany will uh, be considered for asylum in Germany. The idea of Merkel, I don't say she had bad intentions, she probably had good intentions. Good intentions to 
a piece, German public opinion, good intentions to be re-elected in the elections with, with, with German voters, and good, good uh, intentions also to remove some of the burden from uh, Hungary or other countries that uh, through which the refugees were entering the European Union. But the, her remarks saying that any refugee, any Syrian refugee that arrives in Germany would be considered for asylum, instead of solving the problem, instead of saying, Hungary, send me your refugees, we will remove this burden for you. The consequence was a calling effect. The consequence was that for Syrian people having a hard time in Syria and Afghanistan and many other countries, they said, oh, if we manage to arrive in Germany, then we will have this great price of German asylum. German asylum is a very gen generous asylum. There are differences across Europe. Different countries of the Schengen area have different conditions for asylum seekers. And in the case of in the case of Germany, uh, they 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 um, they have very generous conditions compared to other poorer countries inside Europe, like Romania or Bulgaria or Greece or Hungary. Yes, the conditions in in, in Germany or Sweden are much more generous. By increasing the quota, increasing the number of refugees that Germany was willing to accept, instead of reducing the problem of the migrants that were in Hungary or in other places along the way, instead of absorbing only those refugees that were already causing problems in Hungary, what they did was a calling effect for more people from Syria to come into Europe with the hope, with the expectation of arriving in Germany. And the number of refugees, the crisis intensified. Instead of solving the problem, this move that could be with good intentions, or maybe if they knew from the start the consequences of what they did, maybe it was a short sighted move just thinking about public opinion in germany thinking about re-election thinking about the government image for whatever reason they did it created an aggravation of the problem it created a calling effect and when the problem aggravated is when germany said okay we cannot accept so many refugees and germany said we need to place those refugees in other European Union countries. And they started asking countries, which countries are willing to accept these refugees, to be solidary with Germany and to accept some of those refugees. But there was a problem. The problem is that those refugees did not want to go to Romania. Those refugees wanted to leave Syria to have better conditions in Germany, not to go from Syria to Romania with similar conditions. And the second problem is that these countries, these poorer countries, they said, we do not agree with this. Why should we we be solidary with Germany regarding the refugees. If Germany in so many occasions have criticized us and has been unsolidary with, with the rest of the European Union member states, such as in the case of the Euro, in the Euro crisis, why should Greece be thankful to, to Germany? Yes. So what happened is that this didn't work very much so then they started to say you know you should do this you are members of the european union 
it's your obligation it's not something voluntary and they started to approve compulsory quotas for member states quotas of refugees so some kind of creating um, camps in the different member member states for 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 these uh, refugees in some cases uh, this was inevitable to accept this such as in the case of greece because greece is a country that is, is in such a heavy crisis and that has um, it's more or less under foreign administration because it depends on on constant bailouts from other european union member states and they were forced to accept these uh, refugees in other countries they did not agree what uh, germany did in the end was also to seek agreement with turkey to create these camps this kind of concentration camps for refugees in turkey because they thought it could be cheaper for for them to have them in turkey than in other member states but all these and i would like to know your opinion it has created the impression in general in europe that there's not much unity regarding the refugee crisis and i would like to know your opinion about this uh, i think some people also intervene through um, through the chat victor stoika said uh, mm, that they should be treated uh, the refugees that uh, some of those refugees do not have a good behavior yes and they they should be treated more strictly by by the european union what happens uh, i don't know i would like to know your opinion now lorena say something Hi. Well, I already read on the morning uh, news about this topic, the the refugees, and it was something like that Italy didn't accept or uh, didn't answer a call. I don't know if you hear me or not because the music here is too loud. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, it was something like a uh, ship was near Italy and uh, one man from Syria called to Italy to ask if they were, if, because they need help because the ship was um, sunk, yeah? Yes. yes, so they basically don't, don't take care about them, they, how do you say? Mm. I mean, it's such a big problem that they don't attend their needs. Like, they they didn't answer the call or they say it's better call Malta because it's closer. And uh, in truth, Malta was more far, far than, than, yeah, than Italy. It was something... Also, the, the problem is that if, uh, if they accept them in Italy, Mm -hmm. Italy will be the first European country where they step in and it means that according to the Dublin Convention Italy will be responsible for their asylum applications yeah basically that they are ignoring refugees basically was what well, I was trying to say but they, they, they are how, how do you say over overtaken by 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 the situation mm -hmm. by the crisis yes I they guess can I... this alone yes the european union is trying to develop um, a common uh, external border police and common common policies on external borders frontex and mm -hmm. these kind of things but they are still very very undeveloped so the Schengen area is a very ambitious um, undertaking and what happens is that when it is subject to such 
um, um, demanding test as the current refugee crisis, then it shows that you need either to go further with integration or to go back and to reconsider some of the integration steps that you okay. took. Yes? And this is the current uh, the current debate. Okay, yeah. thank you, Lorena. We put you in mute. How about in Chernivtsi? Sophia or anyone who who wants to intervene? So <laughs> I will, I, will, I will discuss this problem with my colleagues one moment. Yes, but I, I, I want it or Sophia to say something. What is, I don't speak very well. <laughs> What what is your opinion? I will I will say uh, just, uh, Ira in Ukrainian and uh, she was translated. Good, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. The TA said that uh, it's um, good uh, and meaning of trading, of uh, economy, of movement, and uh, in, in, in a change in experience and employment, of course. And. Okay. Olga, Olga agrees with uh, Sophia and uh, as for me I think that there is um, a lot of cross this uh, of existing of this uh, area and uh, as for the cons um, I think that the great reason of problem of, um, of the uh, Schengen area is that um, there are there are different different judgment systems systems in uh, different countries, and because of that um, they can't realize the can can't re cannot realize and use them all all of uh, the advantages of this uh, process. So maybe germanization of uh, law systems can can solve this problem. I don't know. It's very deep and wide problem <laughs> to speak about this being not in the, in the, in, the, in the European Union. Okay. Okay. Thank you. How how about the the refugee crisis? My question is to all of you, also to the people who are watching on YouTube. There are now five simultaneous connections on YouTube. Uh, what What do you think the the solution to the refugee crisis would be? How would you solve the refugee crisis for the European Union? What What possible solutions can you think for? Because we are generally very critical about what has been uh, happening and we say it's a, it's a test but we should also try to find a solution for this test what could we do about the refugee crisis so that the situation improves uh, this question is also for the for the people for the people in in on YouTube, yes, is the question how they would deal with the refugee crisis. Lorena, what could we do about the refugee crisis? I think that we have to go to the origin of the problem. We have to go to the basis because we are trying to solve the problem, you know, without taking care 
of the EU have to go to Syria and trying to solve the problematic in Syria because if we don't stop that situation, it has no sense to, you know, receive more and more because it's not going to stop, never. It's continuing. So we have to go to the, the basis, to the origin of the problem and, and try to establish the political situation there. I think that's a very interesting point, Lorena. Thank you. How about people on Gabriela Turetki? Gabriela Turetki on YouTube says we should try to help them remain in their country. All those powerful countries should help them. So to, to help them remain in, in in Syria or in Afghanistan or in other country. So Lorena says that they should treat the problem at the origin. Gabriela should says that we should help them remain there. And um, exactly, so so Gabriela agrees with you, Lorena. How about people in Chernivtsi? What do you think what we, we could do about the refugee crisis? Not many refugees have arrived in Ukraine, right? But this is a problem for the whole European Union and it's a problem that is putting into question the survival of the species. What could we do? We agree with Lorena. You agree with Lorena? Yeah. How, how, how could we solve the problem in Syria? In Syria? I don't know. <laughs> Lorena says that the problem is solved in Syria. Something with sound. I don't hear you. You would. Okay. I put. I think there is echo. Lorena says that we should solve the problem in Syria, but we still have the 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 question: How how can the European Union solve the problem in Syria? Yes, because if there is a war in Syria going on between Russia and the United States, how could the European Union solve this war in Syria? It's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. Lorena? Yeah, I think it's not our problem. <laughs> European Union problem, it's a problem between it's United States and... Our problem because of course, it because it's, we accept the consequences. Of yeah. thousands of refugees. Yeah. It's our problem. But yeah, but I think it's that it's not, we are not the responsible of, of that war. I, I mean, I think that is something that other people must solve, not European Union. I'm talking about U United States. <laughs> but we, we are responsible about what happens to us. Yeah. We are responsible about the problem. What happens, you know, they, I, I heard the, the, the minister, the, the Greek minister, saying that they, to have 400,000 refugees in a camp in Greece, what, what, the, what the European Union is asking from, from them, such a great amount of people has never been concentrated in a camp before, from the times of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. It's a, such a large concentration. Yeah, we are coming back to the past. In the same, in the same place. So it's not a feasible solution for them. But they, you say that we have to solve the problem at the origin. But what could we do to solve the problem at the origin? What what could the European Union do about that? I don't know exactly. I I think I I can answer this question now. But I don't know. Signing some kind of treaty, peaceful treaty. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly. But of course, we have to do something because this, this situation must not continue the, for a long time. At least. That, say that it is someone else's responsibility, someone else is, is to blame for this, or someone else is responsible for this. 
it does not mean that you can just uh, uh, forget about the problem because it is Europe that is suffering the consequences. Exactly. exactly. So if, if Europe cannot solve the problem at origin, then at least maybe they could manage it better at home. <laughs> yeah, it's the only way right now. But this is a good question. There probably there will be questions for the seminar questions about this. Uh, it's important that you participate on the website. It's important that you discuss with other people, you know, in this course that you are taking, Jamone Open Online Course of European Integration, it's a very international course. If you see the flags, now they have so many flags of the people that have participated in this course, the people from China, from Spain, from Romania, from Ukraine, from different, uh, different countries, and we could have um a rich debate we could have an overview of the different opinions about about this uh, this subject another important controversial uh, subject and try to find analysis to try to find explanations together for these questions and to to try to um find solutions also if possible okay thank you thank you all very much for your um, for your participation i i think it, it's uh, today we have had a, a very a very a very good debate and the 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 what we should try now is to continue this debate online to try to continue this debate by writing on these discussion questions for instance sofia kucheritza in in Chernitsi has already written in some of those seminar discussion questions and they already show in, in her profile and there are some questions um, probably about the euro probably about the refugee crisis, about many pressing issues for the European Union at the moment, but also about other issues that are probably, with certainly, much more important than this, such as the single market, the internal market, the possibility that you can import and export goods freely inside the european union the possibility that you can invest in other european union countries the possibility that you can offer your services in other countries the possibility that you can travel and work in in other countries and you do not need a work permit there are many many more achievements than just this you should also remember we said the single market is the most important policy of the european union and this is still true there may be some issues that appear on the news nowadays and maybe people forget the fact that they have multinationals now offering them jobs in their countries because of the european union or they forget that the wages is now much higher because they work for Amazon Development Center in Yash, or they work for uh, Siemens in Yash, or they make uh, Dacia cars. They are produced in in Romania, but they they uh, they are produced with the French uh, technologies. They they should not forget about that. that they have Carrefour, they have Ocean, they have Kaufland. They, they have so many multinationals now that offer jobs that pay higher wages and that offer better conditions and also better prices for consumers. 
they should not forget about the the fact that they they are millions of Europeans now working in different countries from where they come from, and this is because of the single market. They should not forget that uh, now when when you produce one product, you just have to comply with the European Union standards, or you just have to comply with your national standards and then your product you will be able to to be sold all over europe you should not forget that if you study for a degree in medicine in in, in one member state then you will be able to practice as a doctor in other member state these are really remarkable achievements of, of the EU and maybe we forget about them when we think about the euro crisis or the refugee crisis but the internal market maybe it's not on the news maybe it's not on the on the covers of the newspapers but it is working every day it's working every day with people not only in Brussels with people in every member state that every day they make the European internal market. Okay, thank you very much for your presence today. Thank you, thank you um, for your participation, those who joined by Hangouts, also those who uh, attended uh, on YouTube. I, I, I thank you all. Next week, we will have another lecture our lectures will be more and more interesting every week because we have every week more knowledge already and we can discuss uh, more uh, interesting more current topics i will announce you the topic by facebook on our facebook group um and that's all for today i thank you again for your presence and participation and see you next week goodbye